Donc, euh, on passe à la prochaine communication qui est de, de euh, Madame Bronwyn Wilson, qui, il s'avère, est mon collègue de UCLA, euh, qui va donc nous parler de flow, de mobile artist and the early modern Mediterranean urban prospect. Uh, Bronwyn Wilson est donc uh, professeur de l'histoire de l'art à UCLA. Uh, elle a notamment publié uh, le livre uh, The World. Uh, in Venice, Print the City and Early Modern Identity en 2006, et elle est en train de achever un autre projet, The Horizon and Inscription in Early Modern Mediterranean Travel Imagery. Et bon, elle a aussi publié un certain nombre d'ouvrages collectifs uh, portant sur uh, ces questions et de, de questions uh, apparentées. Et, et voilà, donc bah, bienvenue et ah, la parole est à vous. Merci beaucoup. Et je suis très heureuse d'être ici, mais je vais parler en anglais. <laughs> Alors, um, the, f the first thing that I wanted to say is that um, when Sanjay invited me to participate in this, I thought it was really an opportunity to try out some of the things that I've been thinking about. So the talk is not something which has a... Um, a kind of straightforward argument, although there's a trajectory to it. The other, um, the other uh, aspect that I wanted to mention at the outset is that one of the things that I'm trying to do in this project on Mediterranean travel imagery is to take seriously pictorial forms, that is, to try and think about what it is that we bring as art historians to visual material that is quite distinctive from um, from history. So the kinds of evidence that I'm trying to mobilize are, um, might seem unusual. Perhaps not. <laughs> so encounters with unfamiliar places and the concomitant spatial and temporal experiences of journeys during the early modern period gave rise to experimentation with new formats and uses for visual imagery. Cornelius Vudanus's print of the Leiden Library, engraved in 1610, is replete with artifacts that responded to and furthered expanding global interests. Celebrating the opening of the library in 1595, the print identifies the names of the field of study on the shelves of books. It is the diversity of geographical forms, however, that solicits our attention and engages the men in the print. To the right, maps are displayed on the walls with, um, and two small globes perch on a cabinet in the foreground that house the collection of oriental manuscripts. Nearby, on the reading desk, a volume lies open, perhaps a small atlas or an isolario, an island book. Its pages animated as if recently leafed through by a reader. On the left, two figures with their backs to us are reading books that resemble the mariner's handbooks. Two men interact with a large globe, having removed its protective cover, which rests nearby. One identifies a location on the surface of the globe with dividers while gesticulating to his companion. Displayed on the left wall is Melchior Lorch's vast prospect of Constantinople. Lorch, a Danish artist, was ordered by the Holy Roman Emperor to accompany his um, um, to accompany his ambassador, Ogier Gazlan de Busbeck, to the court of Suleiman, uh, Sultan Suleiman in 1554. Begun on site and completed in Vienna after 1559, the city was drawn in pen and ink on 22 sheets of paper that once formed an impressive scroll measuring 11.5 meters in length and 45 centimeters in height. The prospect was intended for circulation in printed form, though it was never reproduced, probably because the scale was too ambitious. The drawing of Constantinople manifests what was a new geopolitical horizon for Europeans. With its texts and multiple leaves hinged together to form a scroll, it perpetually unfolds itself on the wall, as if appealing to readers to suspend leafing through books or turning pages, and to become instead caught up in the flowing calligraphy and pictorial forms. The Golden Horn courses between Galata, the European suburb in the foreground, and the ancient city, the waterway and format emulating each other. In contrast to perspective, which organizes the observer's relation to the depicted image, uh-oh. All right. The, 
The Golden Horn courses between Galata, the European suburb in the foreground, and the ancient city, the waterway and format emulating each other. In contrast to perspective, which organizes the observer's relation to the depicted image from a singular point of view, the composition of the prospect from multiple vantage points encourages us to move horizontally. The crowded channel, channel animated by vessels furthers this effect, which is intensified by the fortifications, city walls, and lines of text running along the edges. At the same time, our lateral movement is arrested by details, columns, mosques, toponyms embedded in the topography that draw us into the cityscape where ancient Christian, Byzantine, and Islamic monuments commingle. Exploring the diverse structures in the ancient city leads to encounters with captions that, read as texts instead of figures, return us to the paper surface. This shuttle between surface and depth occurs repeatedly, even as we peruse the surrounding terrain, where our gaze, I'll leave it there, sorry, where our gaze is periodically disrupted by faint outlines of buildings and foliage where the sky meets the earth. Lork's outstretched arms, seen in his self-portrait on the 11th sheet, contributes to this impulse to move by directing us, like a semaphore toward the left where he turns his head and toward the right where a seated Ottoman chaperone assists him. The turban figure holds the lid of the inkwell with his right hand and the base with his left, over which the artist has suspended his pen, a gesture that highlights the flow it is set in motion. The fluid contours of Lork's stylus, fingers, and inkwell are echoed in the billowing sails, such as the one drawn immediately above, and reverberate in the domes of baths and mosques in the cityscape. Above the artist is another vessel whose swooping sail mimics the languid, fing languid fingers of the assistant's right hand, as well as the winding drapery of his turban. I use Lork's design, to which I return briefly later in this talk, to introduce the oscillation between inscription and the horizon that recurs in some Mediterranean urban prospects. Particularly in the case of European artists, as I argue in the larger picture from which this talk springs, the tension between surface and depth, between here and there, betrays the ambivalence of moving through and working in Islamic jurisdictions. This talk explores this dynamic in four prospects of the artist at work drawn a century later in which observing the landscape is harnessed to making and moving through the landscape. One of these is Raspe, a town in Persia where the draftsman presents himself at work <coughs> creating the view we see before us. From an elevated vantage point, he uses a long quill pen to render the expanse of topography onto a sheet laid out on his lap. A self-portrait was a trope in early modern views of cities and landscapes, but this one invites scrutiny. Since the artist is French, and he has depicted himself in Persian attire, draped in a stole of Khorazan wool and wearing a matching hat from which spirals cascade to create a tasseled brim. His surveying instruments are set to the side and arranged on level ground as if a still life. Nearby, on the bottom of the sheet, are two blocks of stone from which vegetation has sprouted, its foliation evoking the intertwined letters of his signature below. Grelo de Linievat, Guillaume Joseph Grelo drew this. The view of Raspe is one of 51 drawings Grelo made for Ambrosio Bembo, a young Venetian noble. Bembo was 19 years old when he departed in 1671 for Aleppo with his uncle. With the end of the Cretan War between the Venetians and the Ottomans in 1669, Marco Bembo was taking up the position of consul of the Syrian city. Ambrosio stayed for a year and a half in Aleppo, but then continued to India. Inspired by Pietro della Valle's journey from 1614 to 26, he followed the same route, carrying a copy of della Valle's Viaggi and writing a diary of his own. In 1674, on his return journey from India, he stopped in Isfahan, where he met Grelo. Relatively little is known about the French artist until 1670, when his movements emerged from a few diplomatic records from Bembo's manuscript 
and from Grelo's own account of Turkey, the Relation Nouvelle d'un Voyage de Constantinople, that was published in Paris in 1680. On May 12, 1670, he embarked with Jean-Foy Vaillant, a physician and numismatist, from Rome for Izmir and Constantinople. Vaillant does not name the draftsman in his papers, but describes a young man from Malan. Vaillant's mission was to collect coins, gems, and manuscripts for the royal cabinet, as well as to garner knowledge about geography, customs, and religious communities, as well as commercial activities for the government which explains why his manuscripts were not published and perhaps why Grelo was not identified by name. One of the things that is, um, I'm finding with many of the people that I've been working on is that they were working as, um, as, agent, as agents, um, sort of in some ways actually spies. According to Antoine Galland, secretary of the French ambassador in Constantinople, Grelo was in the city from January to June in 1672, which is when he would have met Jean Chardin, um, who was charged with acquiring books for the French Royal Library. Although engaged to journey to Persia with Chardin, Grelo embarked for Lebanon, abruptly changed course again for Syria. When he arrived in Aleppo, having been robbed of his possessions, including his drawings, he wrote to Galland, requesting that he undertake the commission with Chardin after all. They rendezvoused in Tabriz, arriving in Isfahan in June 1673. After a year, as many of you will know, their relationship had deteriorated. Bound by a strict contract, Grelo would receive no payment unless he returned to Paris with Chardin. Nevertheless, when Bembo offered him employment, Grelo accepted, abandoning compensation and his drawings. As a consequence, Chardin's Voyage, published in 1686 as a set of vo four volumes with a separate atlas of illustrations, make no mention of the artist who's only credited with 16 engravings of Isfahan in the 1711 edition. Bembo and Grelo departed together by caravan through Raspe, Bisitun, and Baghdad to Aleppo, where they embarked for Venice, having reunited with Marco Bembo. They stopped briefly at Crete, arriving home in April 1675. Grelo may have stayed with the Bembo family. He thanks both men in his relation, and his drawing of their villa became the frontispiece for the diary. The artist's whereabouts are next documented in Paris in 1677 when he received a royal privilege to publish his Relation. Bembo's manuscript, Viaggio e giornale per parte dell'Asia di Quattro Anni, traveled to France and then to England where it was likely rebound. Since 1964, it's been housed in the James Ford Bell Library at the University of Minnesota. The volume has 315 pages, 38 by 27 centimeters, with worn gilt edging. There are 52 drawings of varying dimensions in brown and black pen and ink, 25 signed by Grelo, and 16 dated by him with the year 1674 or 75. Though Bembo recognized the value of illustrations by an ingenious Frenchman for a book, he never published the manuscript, perhaps uncertain of its literary merits. Two critical editions, in Italian and in English, have brought to light Bembo's experience of journeying through Ottoman, Mughal, and Safavid dominions. However, Grelo's contributions to the manuscript, cities, bridges, antiquities, costumes, monuments, caravanserais, monasteries, various means of transport, and curiosities, have primarily been assessed on the basis of their documentary value and accuracy. The few scholars who have studied them describe them as devoid of artistic finish or merit, as schematic, and as cursory. Yet it is this provisional, indeed improvisional, character of the drawings that warrants discussion, warrants consideration. My focus in this talk, the motif of the mobile artist at work, has been a pictorial analogy in printed cityscapes since the late 15th century for the replicative process of print. Grelo follows this convention, and here you see four details, depicting himself on the edge as a surrogate for the viewer. He observes the site from a distance, but also moves through it, digesting it. 
His depictions of himself also provide a performative variation on the theme of the draftsman in the field. He appears in various guises, dressed in Persian, Turkish, and French attire. Assessing Grelot's drawings is complicated by the fact that the views illustrate passages in the text as if the artist had accompanied his patron for the entire journey. But some of the sites, such as Isfahan, Respe, and Bisitun, appear, um, and those ones appear in the order they were visited. Several designs, however, illustrate things seen only by Bembo. Invention and anticipation is unsurprising in early modern travel writing, which had a questionable reputation. But the claims of pictorial descriptions differed, particularly environments that were less familiar. By directing viewers to see for themselves, prospects attest to first-hand observation, an effect reinforced by the figure of the artist near the picture plane. An expansive view of Aleppo, the eighth illustration in the itinerary, unfolds to the left and the right, where a monumental stone sokol inscribed with the Bembo arms displays a bust of a bearded, turbaned man. To the immediate left of, his family, um, of this family marker is a single pathway that opens up alternative routes into the landscape. Our viewpoint toward the city is given emphasis by the gazes of the adjacent men, a standing figure in Turkish dress with a horse and the artist who is seated to his left. Grelot is attired in a French coat, its hem and sleeves curling in emulation of the paper on which he is working, and the scroll unfurled on the far left that provides a legend to features identified in the topography. The work is signed and dated near the artist on the lower edge, um, Grelot d'Aline, 1675, which directs us to the drawing instruments in the foreground. The arrangement of devices, like the still life beside the artist at Respe, calls attention to the technical skills required for city views. From left to right is um, a diptych dial, an adjacent square edge frames the letter P, a quadrant with a plumb line rests on a sector and a compass or wing dividers, and on the upper right is a terrestrial refracting telescope. The instrument's paper and direction of the artist underscores the dynamics of working on the page and surveying. The latter is reinforced by the outward looking perspective of the Ottoman figure and his horse. The manual work of inscription is thematized in details such as the legend on the scroll and the cartouche, la città di Aleppo, that reproduces the sinuous curves of the banderole with the bembo motto incised on the plinth to the right. Topographical details contribute to our oscillation between close-up scrutiny and surveying from afar. Flora in the foreground metamorphose into architectural structures in the distance. Pathways, fences, and city walls crisscross the middle ground and snake around the densely packed urban center that swells and crests with the undulating terrain. Roads, walls, and domes in the distance echo the winding draperies and forms of the turbans near the picture plane. The turban on the bust, probably a likeness of Marco Bembo, directs us toward the Turkish figure to the left of the plinth and thus to gaze, as he does, on the curving hills and domes of the Syrian cityscape. As formal resemblances urge us to move continuously between the horizon and the picture plane, they also synthesize the landscape. The optical theme established by the artist's instruments is anticipated on the previous sheet, in Tratta del Consoli in Aleppo. The procession of incoming consuls with its emphasis on order and witnessing the diplomatic ceremonies. Consuls, advisors, interpreters, and janissaries seen in the distance are identified with captions. And the forms these groups create in the landscape are echoed by the trees, hills, and minarets behind them that lead us toward the horizon to inspect the figures. Two pairs of men in Turkish costumes flank the scene, serving like the artist's self-portrait as surrogate for viewers in the drawing. On the right, one of the seated men, positioned above a large stone slab um, with the Bembo coat of arms, directs his friend toward the, the parade. This gesture is repeated 
by one of the men on the left, whose associate, looking through an optical device, follows this line of sight, inviting us to perform the same act, to inspect the information for ourselves. On the sheet with Persepolis, Grelo depicts himself in Persian garments, sitting cross-legged with a quill paper and paper, sorry, with a quill pen and paper scroll. Instead of the tasseled hat of Khorasan wool and jacket seen in the view of Respe, he wears an elegant turban and sleeveless robes, with both variations rendered for comparison on another sheet in the journal. In the view of Persepolis, the turban with its fabric springing from the crown points us toward the cloud-like capitals on the columns of the palace. The shape of the scroll on his lap prompts notice of the flowing cartouche and the supine fragment of a column to his right. Blocks nearby, together with the partial standing pillar, call attention to the replicative nature of columns and ashlar blocks of the palace with its myriad staircases of aggregated stones. Details embedded in the mountains lead us past the vast palace, furthering the dialogue between the small and the large, the part and the whole. Adding to this impression of rebuilding the monument is the banderole with its multiple scrolls, which points to the multiplicity of columns on the palace in the picture below that it names. Associations between the still life arrangement of fragments to the right of the artist and the activity of reconstructing the site are suggested by the temporal character of the signature that flows into the undulating drapery of his jacket. Grelo de Lienebat, Grelo was drawing, is the signature. As Sarah Blake McCam has shown, Renaissance artists used the past tense, fecket, he made this, to identify authorship of a completed work, but used um, the imperfect tense, fakiebat, was making to emphasize the temporal process of creation. In the case of Persepolis, the imperfect tense may refer to the fact that he visited the site with Chardin, thus he was drawing the palace before. More likely, I think, the imperfect invites thinking of drawing as a process of making, particularly when ruins are the subject matter. The signature calls to mind both the work of remaking the past in the present and its incom inherent incompleteness. Grelo uses the imperfect again in this view where he's seated together with his patron in a field with the city of Kanya on Crete, seen in the distance. The prospect is puzzling at first, since the hills surrounding the city do not resemble the local topography. Moreover, calculations based on Bembo's commentary indicate the two men did not have time to visit it over land, and they went a different direction at sea. Instead, the drawing, I think, is a clever fiction devised from an earlier representation, perhaps one of the engineering drawings that were made of the island for um, Venetian governors. Um, Kanya was likely chosen by Bembo for its political significance, since it was the first city to fall to the Ottomans during the Long War. And that conversion from Venetian to Ottoman control significantly is rendered in the costumes of the two protagonists and in the cityscape. Bembo, who's seen in profile, drinking from a jug, wears Italian garb, whereas Grelo, to his right, is dressed as a Turk. Venetian fortifications dominate the center of the sheet, but these are punctuated by minarets and domes that rise above the horizontal structure, with the use of the imperfect tense, as at Persepolis. Um, the signature reads Grelo de Linea, 1675, which conveys perhaps the process of remaking history. For at Kenya, the two figures and the architectural structures are analogs for each other that together evoke the Venetian past and the Turkish present on the island of Crete. So before returning to another um, drawing by Grelo, it is useful to consider some earlier pictorial strategies for city views. 
Verisimilitude becomes allied with surveillance in the imperial context of the siege of Ingolstadt, a woodcut made by Christoph Zwickopf in 1549 from Hans Mielek's sweeping design. Fortifications dominate the foreground, which the artist, seen here in a detail and positioned on the bottom of the large sheet, oversees. The expansive vista contributes to the potency of the draftsman unusual vantage point from inside the city walls, as if he is not only rendering the military engagement in the distance, but also directing it. The site was chosen by Charles V for the battle against his Protestant opponents, since the city was loyal to his troops, with the woodcut becoming one of a series commission to reinforce the impact of his territorial policies. Surveying the confrontation from a high yet protected vantage point, Milik conveys simultaneously his strategic value to the emperor and the power of his imperial gaze. This tension between the potency of the artist's perspective and defensive protection reverberates in Lork's prospect of Constantinople. Following Milik's siege, Lork poses before a large drawing board, his back toward us in the middle of the prospect. His vantage point on the fortifications in Galata, the cosmopolitan suburb, and the composition with the horizontal flow of water and city walls across the Golden Horn all rec recall the earlier woodcut of Ingolstadt. There's many other similarities as well. But the similarity with Milik's design sets the differences into relief. The Golden Horn underlines the distance between his position on the fortifications of Galata and the profile view of the city, which accentuates the domes of the Ottoman structures and mosques. That divide is furthered by the contrast between his assistant's monochromatic drapery and turban and his own small cap, jacket, and tailored sleeves that he is exposed intriguingly beneath an outer robe, perhaps a Turkish antari. Milik's and Lork's designs exemplify the rhetorical potential of the distance between the vantage point and the focus of the prospect. It is an oppositional divide for both, and for Lork, also a means of staging difference. An influential precedent for Grelo's prospects is George Brahms and Franz Hogenberg's Civitatis Orbis Terrarum, a series of urban atlases in six volumes published from 1572 to 1618. The Civitatis brings together maps of cities from around the world with local costumes, which are usually situated in the foreground and strategically woven together. For example, in the view of Rome from volume one, the city is facing toward the west, which emphasizes the fortifications that run horizontally across the bottom of the, of the engraving, just above the two costumed figures standing in the center. Echoing the walls and parallel to them are the banks of the Tiber River, which together replicate the bottom edge and decorative banding of the woman's dress. The contours of both of their costumes, which flare out toward the bottom, resemble the walls of the city that drape around the landscape on the north. Note how the left side of the city and the silhouette created by the woman's shoulder and elbow imitate each other. Throughout the volumes, rivers, city walls, terrain, and even architecture are subtly adjusted with sartorial details of inhabitants to correspond with each other. In a few cases in the volumes, the artist is depicted at work, illustrated here in a study by Joris Hofnagel, the Prospectus Montes. Poised with pen and sketchbook on the hill to the left, the artist's focus directs us toward the mountain in the distance, his standing pose and backpack accentuating his mobility. Two figures seen through a passageway in the center foreground reiterate this theme of surveying the city from afar, since both are pictured adjacent to a portable table. The, and I swear this is the case in the drawing, it changes in the engraving. The man on the left, also with a backpack, holds a string for his colleague's surveying apparatus. The detail is one of two that accompany Hofnagel's view of Poitiers. 
signed and dated 1561 and published in 1597. It's the detail on the bottom right. Importantly then, Grelo has fused the two kinds of figures, the artist at work and local costume seen in earlier printed city views. In contrast to Lorc, who asserts his difference from his Ottoman chaperone, Grelo becomes a Turk or a Persian, integrating himself into the landscape. With this idea in mind, let's return to the fourth self-portrait at Ospe, where the interconnectedness of textual and pictorial delineation comes to the fore. Similar to the prospects discussed thus far, the square block of stone in the foreground near the figure prompts consideration of the geometrical forms of the houses nestled in the greenery. Ruins of a fortified structure lie beyond, and a caravanserai is depicted nearby on the left. From its entrance, a faintly sketched path circles around on the left, where it merges into the contour line of the foreground, the hill on which Grelo sits, becomes the curve of a fence, which joins the river that courses around the town on the right. Now, if at first the artist and the arrangement of structures in the topography appear to be disconnected, and I looked at this for months before seeing this, maybe you've been primed, the cartouche above provides a map that unifies them. So taking the artist as a starting point and moving counterclockwise. His location on the landscape is identified by the clover on the bottom left of the calligraphic map. The single tree to his right is marked by another clover. The river bank running along the side of the landscape is crossed midway by a bridge that corresponds to the flow of the ink on the right with its loop. Note how the gap in the cartouche between the end of the E of Raspe and the loop is analogous to the missing planks of the bridge. A dense flourish of interlocking strokes expresses the urban center. A clover unravels at the top for the ruins. The crisscrossing of lines to the left delineates the gridded character of the caravanserai. And finally, the artist's line of sight, articulated by the oblique line of the fence that cuts through the field vertically, and the instrumental character of his pen, are conveyed by the continuous stroke between the clover and the letter P of Respe. Sartorial details further connections between artist, landscape, and cartouche the fluid lines of his hem replicate the contour of the hill on which he sits, while the spirals of wool encircling his head evoke the shape and flourishes of the map. So in contrast to um, sorry, in con uh, that is what I want. In contrast to the tension created in Lorik's view by the divide between the artist in the foreground and the profile view of Constantinople, Grelo entwines the embodied character of drawing and writing with moving through the landscape. He becomes Persian. We might say with Henry Blount that he digested the landscape, as uh, Blount put it in his voyage, sorry, voyage to the Levant in 1634. And the quote, as you can see, the reader is like the reader, so the armchair reader, is like one seated with dishes fitter for another man's stomach than his own, but a traveler takes with his eye and ear only such occurrences into observation as his own apprehension affects, and through that sympathy can digest them into an experience more natural for himself. So this is um, something I'm trying to work out, but I think this um, idea of the difference in Grelo's approach to the landscape is something that um, stands apart from others that I've been working on. Grelo's pictorial cross-dressing overlaps with suspicions about foreigners that were commonplace in early modernity. Vestments were visual signifiers of a person's home or nation, 
and venturing through foreign lands came with risks, as Bembo reports. Quote, the Franks wear hats and dress in their own costumes, but the majority wear an outer robe, as is the custom in that country, so as to accommodate to the nation and so as to avoid the insolence of the people. They throw stones, he says. A beard and local garb were means of avoiding notice, which was particularly important for a draftsman recording information. Recall also that in Lorck's prospect, uh, the artist doesn't look at Constantinople. We see his profile. In contrast, Grelo purposefully observes the scene and avoids being seen. Substantial evidence exists of artists being accused of espionage, such as those found observing fortifications, and recent studies have brought to light their involvement as agents trafficking in information. A well-known example occurred in 1461 when the sculptor and medalist Matteo de Pasti was sent to Constantinople by Sigismonda Malatesta to depict Mahmed II. Carrying a map for the Sultan, the artist was stopped at Crete by Venetian officials who doubted the excuse and took him under guard. Pierre Gilles, who visited Constantinople in 1544 in the service of Francois I, was among those who reported being accosted when copying inscriptions for his topography of Constantinople. The performative character of Grelot's self-portraits that I have been tracing and their allusion to disguise is of a piece with his considerable linguistic skills and stories he narrates in the Relation. Having traveled in the Levant for seven years and fluent in Turkish and conversant as Bembo reports in Latin, Spanish, vernacular Greek, Arabic and Persian, the French artist emerges as an itinerant agent who could maneuver between worlds. This persona is cultivated in the Relation, but his disguises and exploits on the ground are described in the text instead of the illustrations. Geared toward European readers, Grelo often derides the inhabitants of Turkey though he also turns the mirror back on his countrymen and himself. One anecdote oft cited concerns Hagia Sophia. The historical significance of Grelo's book lies in the engravings that made the interior of the mosque available to European viewers for the first time. Um, entrance was prohibited to non-Muslims and thus gaining access, particularly for three days, required more than the artist's long beard and Turkish robes. He relates at length the sequence of payments that resulted in his access to the interior through the lamplighters and the joke they played on him. On the second day in the mosque, having completed some measurements, he reports dining on wine and pork. The insult to the Muslim faith turned into serious danger when he saw a man approaching him. Concealing the food, he retrieved a book and pretends to pray, Gilles' topography of Constantinople substituted for the Koran. Fearing for his life, he confesses to being a Christian, at which point the face of the Turkish man transforms. He, quote, presently serened his tempestuous countenance, not being able to forbear laughing, to see in what a cold sweat he had put me, revealing himself as one of the lamplighters. The anecdote underscores the danger, planning, payment, difficulty, and intrigue of the venture while enhancing the novelty of the engravings and his description of the mosque. Veracity, disguise, and access are repeatedly harness harnessed together by Grelot who explains how he was able to draw on the spot with accuracy, he writes, and to access places Christians could not enter easily. Not surprisingly, disguise, ingenuity, and accuracy were common themes of endorsements that accompanied the English translation, A Late Voyage to Constantinople, published in London in 1683. Under the heading attestations of several famous travelers into um, eastern parts, men of diverse professions compared the illustrations with sites they had seen for themselves. According to Monsieur Galland, for example, 
an antiquarian and interpreter of the Eastern languages, Crelo has so well represented to the life those places which I have seen in Constantinople, in the archipelago, in Cyprus, and in Syria, that casting my eyes upon his delineations of some other places where I have not been, I am apt to believe that I see the originals themselves. The common refrain is that the drawings are exact renderings of the original. The function of the endorsements, like the anecdotes, is similar to the figure of the artist who verifies that he has seen what we now observe. Grelot provides a variation on the theme with his illustration of the exterior of Hagia Sophia. In the right foreground of the engraving are two men, one seen from the back with an open book on his lap. The standing figure gestures to the book with his right arm and to the mosque with his left. Their elevated position in the foreground exploits the trope of the artist, but instead of creating the drawing we see on the open pages, the seated figure is presented as a reader. The standing man points to the mosque, to the monument itself. The seated figure conveys that what he sees in the book is the same as the original. The illustration thereby anticipates the endorsements that the copy is a substitute for being there. So the, um, I'll just uh, conclude very briefly with this other engraving from the relation, from the relation. This is the um, Vue de la Laspente et la Propentide. And here, in contrast to the embodied figure of the artist in the landscape in Grelot's drawings and the mobility offered viewers by the roving line of his pen, the vantage point of this view is Olympian. The terrain is rendered as an object of knowledge with Constantinople visible on the horizon and identified by name. Grillo writes with the image, from the top of this cape or promontory, you may take a full prospect of all the lovely country of Troas together with the rivers falling from the famous mountain Ida. For Grelo, the prospect conveys expectation that one may take or that you will take. The term prospect was used by early modern travel chroniclers such as Pietro della Valle to describe views from terraces and towers. In his account of Cambay in 1663, for instance, he refers to a sepulcher of a Mohammedan quality, having a high round cupola like a tower which is ascended by a little ladder. And there you have a most goodly prospect upon the sea and land to a great distance. This association with control becomes implicit in the term prospect, which was defined in the 16th century as an extensive or commanding site or view, a view of the landscape as affected by one's position. By the mid 17th century, the term prospect had replaced landscape designating a view outward, a looking forward in time as well as space. The idea that for Grelo a prospect is about expectation that you may see this is important, I think, in the fact that the book was dedicated to Louis XIV and Grelo recommends his prospects to the king for considering military action against the Ottoman Empire. The tension between here and there, between us and them that I have been tracing in prospects, in drawings, has been transformed into what some might call Orientalism. Thank you. Thank you. Once more, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, probably in, in, uh, for art historians, this is part of the risks the trade. <laughs> I have a, a small question for you and then perhaps I can throw the, it open. Um, uh, this whole idea of actually having an artist accompanying a traveler, right, which is very clear in the case of uh, Grelot and then the relationship with Chardin and then the kind of poaching of Grelot by, by Bembo. Yes. Um, I was wondering how far back this goes, because um, uh, let me just give you a specific uh, question, uh, entry into this. So just a little bit before, uh, a very similar itinerary to these was uh, followed by uh, François de Gouzla uh, La Boulaye, 
right, who published his, his uh, uh, travels in uh, edition of 1653 and then in edition of 1657. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've actually, if you look at the, the, the manuscript that, that exists of, uh, of Le Boulay's uh, travels, which is in the, in the Academia de Linche, I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't draw to save his life, right? So he actually did these horrible drawings uh, which, which uh, then somebody else had to take and transform into sort of vaguely respectable woodcuts which, were, which went into the thing. Uh, but what is really interesting is then as a result of it, he was obliged to do two things. Right? One is he got a professional artist to do the frontispiece mm -hmm. and which shows him in uh, Turkish costume. And he says that when he traveled, he took the name of Ibrahim Bey. Mm -hmm. And so he's there he is in full turban and, and, and regalia and so on, which sort of recalls <coughs> the way Grillo looks, except the Grillo is always seen from the back. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the second thing which he did, which is really, really interesting, was that he then got Indian artists to fill in what he couldn't do himself. So then he actually got these Indian artists to fill in the gaps in his, uh, so he left spaces where Indian painters would come in and, mm -hmm. and make paintings mm -hmm. for him. Mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, then the, the need for that is obviated if you have your own your own artist going into travels so with you. Yeah. yeah, so then, you know, at, at that moment, that conversation ceases to happen because you don't need the, uh, mm -hmm. the representation made by the other of, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. sort of this etic emic play stops, right? So okay. first, so to, to, to make my question more concise, uh, when does this particular idea of having the professional wandering artist uh, do you think it begins with Grillo, or is it older than that? And what effect would that have, say, in comparison to a situation where you don't have your own artist, and then you're, you're, you're uh, obliged to fall back on, on other resources, like, for instance, finding people who are there yeah. uh, on the spot? So it's, um, your, your question is an immense one because of the fact that there were so many travelers and also because of the fact that we rarely have evidence about who illustrators were. So sometimes you see on ships there'll be um, an identification of an illustrator, often somebody who is from, um, often from the Low Countries because of the fact that they were trained in how to produce um, maps, other kinds of uh, drawings of landscapes. So my sense is that there were quite a few people who were traveling and picking up, doing exactly this kind of thing much earlier, like mm -hmm. easily in the 16th century and, and, um, and before as well in the 15th century. It's been one of these things where I've looked through a whole series of different, um, different artifacts and what has really captured my attention is experimentation with format. So what I've been looking at are things that often fail where the, for example, that um, the reason that I think Lorch's prospect is so interesting is that it was too ambitious. It never actually was published. One of the things I'm looking at is um, a sketchbook um, that's in Leiden that shows city views between Vienna and Istanbul. It doesn't show those two cities, interestingly. And as you turn the pages, you see the topography change from being a Christian landscape or cityscape to um, to an Islamic one, and you can uh, to an Ottoman one, I should say, and you can go back the other direction. And it's very cinematic, cinematographic. The rivers cross the pages, and so there's these. Um, what what I find fascinating is efforts to explore the potential of drawing to be able to convey something about the temporality of the journey. So I'm thinking a lot about the ways that time, different forms of temporality, become um, deposited in, in forms, in, in lines. And it's also why most of the things that I've been looking at now are drawings. And some are very scrappy. So I have one, um, uh, Francesco Lupazzolo, um, who uh, worked, sorry, Francesco Lupazzolo, who produces um, three, three relazioni, a couple of isolari, and he is essentially working for the Jesuits. He's um, keeping an eye on things in the Mediterranean. And he does these drawings that Hasluck says are kind of scrappy. And they're actually really kind of fascinating because you can see where he's taking some of the ideas from in order to draw these, uh, draw these images. So that's exactly what I'm interested in rather than seeing that as a, rather than seeing that as a convention. But I'm really looking at anomalies. Uh -oh. 